This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Today, we are joined by the Reverend Dr. Paula Stone-Williams. Paula is a pastor, counselor, speaker, LGBTQ plus rights ambassador, and gender equity advocate. Paula's devotion to authenticity caused her to leave her comfort zone as a nationally known religious leader and follow her heart to transition into Paula. She lost all of her jobs and most of her friends. Paula Williams also discovered the massive differences between life as a male and as a female in the United States. Her TED Talks have been viewed by millions of people. She writes about these experiences in her soon-to-be-released memoir, As a Woman, What I Learned About Power, Sex, and the Patriarchy After I Transitioned. We'll discuss the book, her work in gender equity, gun violence in America, and much more. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be listening. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And we're back, baby. We are back again to Vickers and an Ian. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London. Kevin George here from St. Aidan's Church in Northwest London, Vicar number two. My name is Ian. I'm that Ian that he was talking about. That's right. He is the... And, And a recent graduate of the University of Und. (laughs) <laughs> yeah und und, und. und. Is, uh, underneath that does it say deware no it's just hockey oh, oh und <laughs> hockey i thought it was gonna say und und deware underwear <laughs> well, we're glad you're back with us folks uh great guests today that we're looking forward to chatting with today we welcome to the vicar's crossing pastor counselor speaker lgbtq ambassador and gender equity advocate paula stone williams and she'll be with us shortly and we'll be discussing her upcoming book uh, which is called as a woman what i learned about power sex and the patriarchy after i transitioned great book and uh yeah she's uh she's going to be with us book comes out on june 1st so much to look forward to there let us do a land acknowledgement before we begin today folks as the vicar's crossing acknowledges that our podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the anunashabek haudenosaunee the lenawayapuk and atawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the london township samba treaty 1796 and a dish with one spoon covenant wampum this land continues to be a home to diverse and indigenous peoples including first nation metay and inuit and whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society we look forward to continuing to work towards reconciliation and doing what we can uh, to advance uh, good relations between all peoples on these lands Mm, very good thank you And, you know, we certainly wouldn't be here without you, our wonderful listeners, so we thank you, but we also would not be here without our sponsors who have been uh, so generous in in supporting our podcast. We want to say hello and thank you to A. Millard George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. Thanks to Dave Mullen and his staff at A. Millard George today. Good people over there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also good people at Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally locally operated, locally owned, and locally loved. Uh, Carol Basada is the pharmacist there, the owner pharmacist, an incredible person. I'll give you an idea of the sort of person you're going to have in your life as a pharmacist. Um, Sadly, uh, my wife, Catherine Ann, broke her ankle uh, a little over a week ago. And Carol heard that news and phoned just to check in on her to see how she was doing. Wow. You don't get pharmacists like that anymore. So... Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, folks, get yourselves over there. Get away from your big boxes and go visit her. And last but certainly not least, you want to say a special thank you to the other great people that we know. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other great people that we know. Yes. At Molly Maid. <laughs> Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Trisha Lister is one of those fantastic people that we would like to thank who hooked us up with that. So. Your place looks pretty clean there today. Ian, she been in or? 
Yeah, well, because of the the big lockdown, I've been kind of doing a lot of organizing myself. I'm not a huge fan of like clutter, so like okay. this, I have Pokemon tins for those of you who are listening. Um, yeah. that, that are my uh, dresser back here that are eventually going to be going to my neighbors who are young children, so they would get Ooh. a kick out of those. Okay, you moved good. from the Pokemon phase. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Little I'm gonna hard. keep the I'm gonna keep the good ones, obviously. Keep the good ones. I mean, don't, yeah. just give them the trash. <laughs> so today is uh we're recording today on uh 420 yes yeah oh, yes. Right? It's 420. This is, that's right i've forgotten that this is marijuana day isn't so it? that's right so shout out to this is how i remember 420 every year my youngest son kyle's birthday today happy so birthday happy 23rd to you uh, to kyle who was born on 420 and it's wow. always the day after another guy's birthday i know who just celebrated a milestone number our Revy kevy is the yeah. big Bible. I turned 50 oh, yesterday, birthday. folks. Thank happy you. Happy birthday. Thank happy you very birthday, much. Kevin. Yep. I'm so old now, I fart dust. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I was just, Rob, you don't want. <laughs> Rob and I were just talking, and I was saying that I'm the youngest of seven, and I watched them all turn 50, and 50 to me was a very old number. Uh, I always thought, especially when my oldest brother, who's 21 years older than me, turned 50, I was still a kid. You know, I, wow. mean, I was in my 20s. So I'm like, oh my God, 50. And uh, in the blink of an eye, here we are. And uh, so Rob and I are nursing the ailments of our 50s while we hang around, hang out with this 20 year old youth. <laughs> so, so, Ian, when you think of being 50, what goes through your mind? Oh, canes and. <laughs> no, <I'm> joking. <laughs> um... <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's not something that I like to think about, really, because no, no, I'm, don't, still, no, I'm, don't. I'm focusing on being being my age right now. All right, right. Yeah, no, yeah. Like no, healthy and, and, and fit and, you know, right. all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. Good, good. All right. Well, guys, let's play another round of our new game here on the Vickers Crossing. It's a little bit of fun we like to call. It's not a lie if you believe it. Wait, 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 wait. It's not a lie if you believe it, Robbie. What is it? Not at all. No, as, as George would tell. Um, so what we're going to do is one of us is going to tell a story today about themselves and the others will try to guess if it's true or not. And if it's a lie and that person believes it, well, then I guess, well, it's, I guess not it's not a lie. I guess according to George Costanza. <laughs> no, not at all. So I think it's my turn, guys. It's you today. I want to know what, what you've been up to. I was inspired by Kevin's story of a few weeks back of being um, put in the pig pen because he was a bad boy when he was little. Oh. <laughs> so my story is somewhat around that. It's, it's, it's under the agriculture um, uh, headline. And so what my story is, is that when I was living in London here in the early 1980s, we lived in the city. And uh, every morning I would go out into my backyard and we would have cows. Mm. And I would go and I would feed the cows from the backyard of my home um, here in London when I was in grade nine or 10. Mm. You were feeding cows in London, cows? Ontario. Cows, yeah. Yeah. Cows. Well, what did you feed them, Robbie? Like, Just like, what, like breadcrumbs or whatever bread we had. We'd, we'd come bread. out, me and, me and my brother, and we'd go out, and there'd be just, cows in, in the backyard. Chuck and food we would to the cows. Chuck food cows. to the cows. Mm. In London. This is a very in move. The city. This is a very moving story. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, utterly ridiculous. <laughs> wow. I, I, I think it's so utterly, utterly ridiculous that I'm going to say no. We didn't do that. Yeah, I'm kind of with Kevin on this one. I don't know if there would ever be a time where, because I'm thinking like in London, it gets kind of cold, and you need a place to like house the cows. You know, mm. so like especially in the winter um so i think that's no i think i think you're fibbing to us i think lying to your teeth well you guys are good <laughs> but but you're not that good it actually is true <laughs> See? What? And, and so so this is back early 19 like 81 82 uh, i lived um over on the corner of if you can picture wonderland and commissioners road yes yeah and right now on that corner there's a big food basic store yes, and right. Hortons and yep. start all up there but in the early 80s that was all farm fields, probably farm field and grass. Yeah. yeah. So literally we would, our house uh, backed onto that field and there was a little chain fence and there were cows that used to graze in that field. Oh. And our dogs used to chase them up and down the fence line. Wow. And we would go out sometimes. And if there was scraps or whatever, breadcrumbs, my brother and I would go over and chuck, the, <laughs> chuck, chuck the food at the cows who were, we would watch them from our back deck. Yeah. Well, I guess as you could say, as so, a kid, you milked that for all it was worth. Oh, big time. Oh, wow. Big time. <laughs> uh, oh, 
<laughs> He's a funny guy. He's a funny hey, guy. Hey, you know what I put together for the first time in my life yesterday, by the way? You brought up the story I told about the pigs a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Guess what year I was born on the Chinese calendar? Year of the pig. The year of the pig. <laughs> Everything comes together. together. <laughs> it all comes together. It just dawned on me yesterday. I'm like, ah. Oh. Uh, yes, I remember that. My 50th birthday. I finally clued in. Well, little wonder she put me on pigs. But that's a good one, Robbie. All right. That's a true story. And remember, if it's not a lie, if you believe it. Well, that's right. It's not a lie. You believe it. Mm-hmm. So uh, great, guys. Hey, Paul, Paul, it's here. And so we're going to just uh, take a breath and bring Paula in and we will start our discussion with her. No lie. Paula is no here. No lie. And we are so happy to welcome to the Vickers Crossing podcast, Paula Stone Williams, who's joining us today on a day that she's uh, taking a break from talking so she can talk for a while. So Paula, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? You know, I've always been a Renaissance person. And so I've always done like a hundred different things, but all of them have to do with talking. Yeah. I make my living talking. So really what's happening here is pretty normal. The only exception to that is that I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a pastoral counselor and I work from a person-centered therapy perspective, which means that I really am truly deeply listening and not talking during sessions. And that is actually quite unusual for me. In fact, I do have friends in some places who question whether or not I actually can do that. And I say, well, you should pay me to be your therapist. And then I, you would actually see. <laughs> you I see, I can do it. I, I can, can do, do it. <laughs> It's of course, I can never do that because, you know, you can't be a therapist to your own friends. But I still, know, but still, I do fun. have the capacity. <laughs> That's good great. for you. Well, we appreciate you taking the time today because we know uh, the book is coming out soon um, as a woman. And you've been recording the audio book, which is exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, I was thinking, as you said that about talking, my father told my my dad was one of these people that was really good with with his hands. He was a handyman type person could build anything and my brothers i have four of them are all the same way and i'm not so i can remember being out in the shed with him one day trying to help him with something and he finally turned and looked at me and said kevin it's a good job you can talk <laughs> and I said, Why is that? because he says if you couldn't talk you wouldn't eat because you're, <laughs> you're useless <laughs> so, so you're in good company here paula um listen you're coming at us from uh uh colorado uh and uh I thought we'd start by just sort of touching base a little bit about how you guys are doing out there. Look, it's only a month ago, March 22nd, uh, that the mass shooting occurred uh, nearby where you live, I think, um, at uh, Boulder, at King Super Supermarket. Ten people were killed, including a local on-duty police officer. Uh, you live near there. We can't imagine what uh, your community must be going through at a, at a time like that. Can you share with us how, how folks are and, and how things are going there a month later? Like, I mean, it's, it, it must be a very tender time. It is. Boulder County is a very liberal county and has, in fact, um, gun safety laws that are pretty strict, one of which was struck down by a judge just mm. days before the shooting. And it was uh, greatly af- affected our community. It, it, it did me. I knew that one of my co-pastors had been in that shopping center that afternoon. Wow. I was in New York when it happened and I couldn't reach her. Mm. And she was in interviews and didn't know that I was trying to reach her and I was utterly terrified. And as soon as I got back to town, we went over there. She grew up not a half mile away. And it was, um, it was difficult, but it was also strangely hopeful because mm. there were hundreds of people there and a, a beautiful memorial had been established and it was just uh, literally three days after the shooting. Mm. And you realize that the majority of people, I think the majority of Americans want gun mm. safety. Mm-hmm. It is in fact, a rather interesting and uh, not representative group of politicians who do not. And of course, that has more to do with their funding mechanisms than anything else. Plus, of course, with our tendency as a species, but particularly heightened, I think, in this nation of our ability to create enemies that don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a particular phenomenon in the United States right now. I mean, it's just shocking 
this particular period of time. And I was just, uh, before I came over here, um, the news that there's a shooting at a grocery store, in Long Island today, um, with, uh, one, one dead and two or three injured in hospital. And, um, it's been now I, I, by at least CNN's count 50 mass shootings uh, since uh, March 16th when eight people were killed uh, and one wounded in Atlanta uh, in the um, shootings at the uh, massage parlors. Um, the United States has seen over 150 mass shootings in, in 2021 alone. Um, according to data from the Gun Violence Archives, a nonprofit based in Washington, you write about your feelings on your blog about you, how you were in New York and, and as you had said, and you were uh, when that shooting happened in Boulder and voicing your frustration with the scourge of gun violence. You wrote this: the majority of us, and this is what you just said. I mean, it's it's so important for us, particularly those of us who are neighbors watching this. It's like, man, what is going on over there? But the majority of us. Um, want something different. You're right. The majority of us have been rendered powerless on this important subject. While people like Ted Cruz, I'll cross myself here for saying his name out loud, while Ted Cruz uh, virtually guarantees that thousands more Americans will be killed by deranged men. And you, and you go on to say, you cannot remain silent in the presence of evil. Uh, I will speak about senseless tragedy. Now, Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, uh, who comes out with guns blazing, uh, literally was fundraising with an email just two hours after that shooting in uh, Boulder, um, asking her supporters to pony up uh, to keep radical liberals from taking our guns, as she put it. She, too, uh, was full of thoughts and prayers after the shooting. Um, always lots of thoughts and prayers after one of these tragedies, I find. And it seems all too often that many evangelicals uh, have just that answer. We're just going to pray about it. We're just all going to pray. We have lots of thoughts and prayers. Uh, Right-wing politics, Second Amendment fundamentalism, and right-wing Christianity uh, and, and fundamentalism all seem to go hand in hand. Um, that said, though, I think hearing what you just said, and, and I'd like for you to expand on a little more, Progressive Christians like yourself and the religious left are increasingly finding their voice and they're increasingly, I think, uh, I mean, I think it showed up in the last election. I think the support for President Biden and what he was uh, advocating at the time and, and the number of pastors who signed on to what he was doing. I think the left is finding a voice. We can't remain silent in the presence of evil is what you said. What is the way forward for us? How do we find that voice to speak up in the face of this violence and, and in the face of loud voices like, like Bobert and Cruz's of the world? Like how, do we, how do we counterbalance that? I believe we have to be more politically involved than ever before. I am a registered independent, have been for a long time, mm -hmm. but I was very involved in the presidential campaign. Um, one of uh, the, the head of faith-based initiatives for the campaign is Josh Dixon, who now is deputy director for faith-based initiatives in the Biden White House. Now, Josh is a close friend of mine, and I told him early on, buddy, I'm with you. I will do whatever needs to be done. And so mm -hmm. I was very involved. We particularly put a lot of effort into the swing states, where we knew that there was, in fact, a shift that many evangelicals are having a more difficult time, particularly educated evangelicals living in suburban and urban areas, mm. are having a, a more and more difficult time remaining within the evangelical fold, the more right-wing it becomes. And so with a real push toward those people, particularly suburban women evangelicals, uh, I think that Josh's work and the work that we all did together made a huge difference that mm -hmm. might, in fact, have swung the election. I think we've got to be that involved. I don't think we really have much choice at this mm. point. Mm. Yeah, there's often a, um, I mean, that's the frustrating part, I think, for those of us who are tend to be on the left side of these equations, that uh, there's often a reticence to get involved in these things. And it says, oh, uh, Christians have ceded any sort of public discourse, which is what we talk about on this podcast, you know, faith in the public square, but it's as though we've ceded that territory to, uh, 
to the right as, as if there's no, there's no involvement for us. And I think that one of the things that was heartening for me in, in watching the American election was, was just seeing, uh, you know, one of the candidates, Biden himself, talk about his faith so regularly and people like Pete Buttigieg and others talking openly about how their faith influences their public policy. I think we need to, we need to have that conversation. Yeah, I think one of the greatest honors that I've experienced was being able to participate in the presidential inaugural a prayer service mm -hmm. uh, with such a distinguished group of people who are, in fact, willing to lay it on the line. We really have no choice in our current environment. For far too long, the evangelical world has chosen just two social issues that fascinatingly <laughs> cost their patriarchal leadership absolutely nothing. Nothing. You know, the, the, the two issues are, um, you know, abortion and LGBTQ plus uh, people. Yeah. And, um, you know, since it's a patriarchal world and in so many of the evangelical denominations, not a single woman can be ordained. Yeah. Um, abortion, not their problem. No. And fewer than 3% are gay. So, hey, yeah, let's just choose two yeah. issues that Jesus never said anything about, um, <laughs> yeah. that will cost us nothing yeah. uh, as leaders to hold, mm -hmm. instead of maybe choosing a position that would cost us everything, like um, um, all the injustices that exist, or systemic racism, right. or uh, socioeconomic um, problems in our nation. Well, see, those would actually cost me something. Right, so nope, right, yeah. don't think I really yeah. want to pick those <laughs> yeah. as an issue. Don't yeah. drag I mean, it don't seems drag so... Anymore. Yeah. seems so obvious when you're outside of evangelicalism, but it's such a all-encompassing bubble. Mm. When you are inside of it, you mm. are just blind to some yeah. of these things that are obvious to those looking in from the outside. Right. Yeah, very much so. Well, hey, we want to talk a bit about your book coming up, because I know that that's uh, it's an exciting time right now, probably a bit nerve-wracking as well. The new book is coming, which is called uh, As a Woman. And I, we joked a little bit off the top because I said you were joining us to talk because you've been talking all day. Um, and I know you're in the studio recording, right? Kind of preparing the audio version. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you're feeling about as the book's release draws uh, closer? I think the first part of June and um, a bit of a bit of excitement and maybe a little fear on the other side as well. How are you feeling about things? No one should ever write a memoir. It is, <laughs> it is just... It is not to be recommended. Oh, if wow. you do write one, make sure that you can get, I don't know, a nine figure advance. <laughs> uh, it, it's just because that's the only thing that possibly could make it worth it. I have been in tears mm. for two days. Oh, wow. Because it's a hard story. It is. You know, the, the book is As a Woman What I Learned About Power, Sex, and the Patriarchy After I Transitioned. And the book went to auction and there were multiple companies interested in publishing the story. And one of the larger companies wanted a book on gender inequity because that's what I speak about in most of my TED talks. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Simon and Schuster won the bid and they wanted a memoir. And so the book mm -hmm. is As a Woman, What I Learned About Power, Sex and the Patriarchy After I Transitioned. And there are two chapters in the book that are about um, the differences between experiencing life as a male and as a female. There are two chapters about why the evangelical church behaves as it does toward the LGBTQ plus population. There's a chapter on the difference between experiencing sex as a male and as a mm -hmm. female. But the other chapters are in fact just all my story. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard, it's mm. difficult. But you know, I knew, I was well known in my denomination, which is a larger evangelical denomination. And I knew I couldn't just disappear into the night. I knew when I transitioned that embedded in my identity were responsibilities and that I would need to tell my story because I'm, I'm strong enough to. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I look at yeah. so many trans women of color, particularly mm -hmm. who don't have, you know, I, I brought a lot of my privilege with me when I transitioned. I'm strong, mm -hmm. I'm a big girl, I've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. And so I can take uh, the attacks and mm -hmm. oh, they are never oh, ending. Must be incredible. Um, yeah. But you know, I know how to protect myself from it, but it is difficult. It's, it's mm -hmm. just been, it's, uh, it's hard. I never listened to audio books, but now that I'm reading my own book, it's like, oh, this is going to be better to listen to than it is going to be to read. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> because there's yeah. just, you know, yeah. even though I'm doing it word for word, there's so much more 
emotion. I mean, mm. there's, I, I just cry right through it. And I we bet. don't pause, yeah. we just keep going. Right. Well, yeah. especially with you reading it yourself. Oh, definitely. Like not yeah. contracting it yeah. out to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did not want anyone else uh, reading yeah. it. It's, I, I wanted to do it myself. Well, we were very thankful that you uh, gave us an advanced copy before our, our podcast Thank today. It is incredible. Um, and an eye opener and transformative for people like myself, uh, cisgender folks like myself, to to enter into uh, all that you're offering. Um, you lived as a man until 2012. Uh, you were married for for over 40 years uh, with with kids. Worked as a CEO of a huge religious nonprofit as a man. Um, and you write about how how different it is to live in the world as a woman. Uh, profession, personally and professionally, and we'll get to that in a bit. But you write powerfully about the feelings of, of being um, uh, a young man. And, and early in the book, you write about meeting uh, Kathy and falling in love and getting married. And you say you had been acting as if your gender issues would be miraculously cured if you got married. Um, and you describe uh, about waking up the day after your marriage, knowing that um, that was not going to be the case. Uh, that you were supposed to uh, have been born a girl. Can you share a little bit more about that that story and that that uh, place that you came to the day after? You know, I think we are so naive when we are raised as evangelicals, and we did not have intimacy before marriage. And so I really was convinced that somehow our first night of intimacy would cure me. Mm. And I woke up the next morning and I remember exactly lying in bed, staring up at the ceiling, which was concrete slabs lying <laughs> side by side, each one about, I don't know, maybe 24 inches from the other. Uh, they were vertically arranged from my field of vision and seeing puck marks in the concrete. Mm. And that is just seared on my memory because the thought that came was, oh my God, I'm in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. And I shoved it away as fast as I possibly could because I didn't have the emotional resources to deal with it at that point. Nobody knew anything about what it meant to be transgender at that point. There were no books right. in the library. There was nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was utterly completely terrifying. I had known it from the time I was three or four. And but I also discovered pretty quickly as a good evangelical child that uh, transitioning genders was not possible and that God, right. no matter how hard I prayed was not going to change me. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I went into marriage naive. And I had not told Kathy before we married because during my college years, it had been kind of a back burner issue. It really hadn't been that much of an issue. But after we were married, it was like, oh, it's back. And so yeah. I did tell her at that point. You were quite young, eh, Paul? I you was were three or when I first realized it. I was 21 when I got married, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And as a young child, you're growing up in, um, you're growing up as a young boy in a conservative evangelical family, as you mentioned. Um, you, we were mentioning earlier about the cost of of, of uh, I was thinking of Bonhoeffer, the cost of discipleship and what we have, what it, this costs us in a lot of ways. But um, what, when you look back at that, um, how, were you, how were you forced to cope with that as a young boy in that kind of conservative um, world that you were living in? And, and, and what was the cost for you? You know, I think we're coming to realize, not a lot of study has been done on gender dysphoria, but I think we're coming to realize there might be actually more than one um, condition, if you will, or one diagnosis. And there is a whole class of transgender children, usually identified male at birth, mm. who extremely early in life identify as female. So I think of one of my neighbors, for instance, whose daughter said identified male at birth. Her first phrase was, mommy, I a girl. And we oh, know wow. that these children tend to be quite effeminate from the mm. time they first begin expressing any kind of gender representation. And as they grow older, most of the time, they are attracted to straight men. Mm. Then there's a whole nother group that usually does not identify as transgender 
or does not transition genders until much later in life, even though they may have recognized very early in life that they were in fact transgender. Mm -hmm. And this second group uh, does not threaten suicide early in life mm -hmm. uh, because this second group probably is, and I'm speaking my opinion at this point, is probably living a little bit more in the liminal space between genders. Mm. So for me, when I realized I did not have an option to change genders, uh, it's like I said in my first TED talk, I didn't hate being a boy, I just knew I wasn't one. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and so you uh, really, it, it was not a horrible childhood. I regularly prayed at night that I would wake up, wake up as a girl. Mm. And when I did, it was like, oh, well, uh, it wasn't until junior high uh, which of course is hell for everyone. Yeah. Um, that is in fact what hell is. Hell is perpetually yeah. living I think as a correct. junior high person. I think yeah. that's correct. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I'm with in you, Paula. some really lousy city somewhere, <laughs> yeah. this yeah. is hell. It's 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 at least purgatory. Oh, if not hell. Yeah. At the very um, least. <laughs> but for me, it was exacerbated because you know my body was beginning to change in ways that were awful. I think for a lot of us in that second category, for us, the real difficulty comes when testosterone shows up. Mm. Because the one thing virtually all of us experience is with the arrival of testosterone is an, oh, no, mm -hmm. no, no, mm. no, this is not supposed <laughs> to be here, yeah. and was never experienced as most uh, men experience testosterone. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, once testosterone was gone and estrogen arrived, my entire body was like, yes, I kept telling you this is what was supposed to be happening. <laughs> right, right. In fact, I remember going back to my doctor after just two months on a very low dose of hormones. And the idea at that point was maybe just a low dose of hormones would, would stop me from having to transition. It would just settle down my body and my brain. And when I went back just two months later, she said, whoa, your body is responding like the body of a 14 year old. She said, somebody your age doesn't respond like this to estrogen. Wow. She said, Paula, your body has been craving this stuff. Wow. And indeed, I mean, the changes that estrogen brought about in my body were like massive and almost overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ian, I believe. Yes. That was a, yeah. yeah, sorry. I was just like taking in that, that, that story because that's, that's really cool to hear about um anyway so for a lot of people in the lgbtq plus community especially trans um trans people coming out is terrifying um and you give us a snapshot into that and the kind of fears that you have sorry i just thought i was frozen for a second because everyone was just still yeah Moving we're still, on. We're still here. We're still here. Cool. We're just we're mesmer we're mesmerized, we're mesmerized by your words. <laughs> totally mesmerized. <laughs> we're just continuing in. You got us wrapped. I was yeah. Anyway, so where was I? Yeah. So you give us a snapshot into that those kinds of fears and worries about coming out. Um, you describe a little bit in in the book, um, which I'm sure people will will read, um, and about like other fears, including transitioning around that so like divorce and and passing as a woman and things like that um obviously we're thankful that you are who you are and and you can express yourself the way that you are yeah that's a correct sentence um a lot of people that may be listening to this could have similar sort of similar feelings towards um coming out and transitioning and and as someone who who lives in the the sort of spheres that this podcast is a part of um what what would be your advice um and how would you counsel someone who's in the similar situation that you might be well i think it's important to know what's likely to happen we know that people identified with gender dysphoria which is what the dsm-5 calls being transgender have a 41 percent suicide attempt rate which is six times higher than any other diagnosis in the dsm-5 and post-transition, in the first year, there's a 35% suicidal ideation rate. Mm. And many of the people like Paul McHugh that are very opposed to people transitioning genders and, and are aligned with the right-wing Christian world say, well, look at that. That's not really much of a difference. Well, actually, it is a huge difference. One is suicide attempts. The other is suicidal ideation. So the truth is 92% of people who transition genders do not want to detransition. Mm. 
they're happy they transitioned genders. Mm. So let's just isolate that 8%. Mm. If you look at the 8%, 96% of that group, this is just of the 8%, 96% of that group, 24 out of 25, like their new body. Mm. The reason they want to detransition is not because they don't like their new body. It's because of the way the world is treating them. Yeah. Oh, wow. Three okay. issues cause post-transition suicidal ideation. The first is the loss of family, friends, church, community. Mm. And of course, that now is not quite as bad as it was, uh, thanks to a Supreme Court decision last year that says transgender people cannot be fired in all 50 states. Previously, it had only been 21 states. And of course, it still does not apply to people who work for a religious corporation. Mm. Um, but still, people lose their friends. They lose their community. Uh, life becomes very difficult for them. That's the first reason we see great difficulty post-transition. The second is that they do not pass in their new gender. And this is mm. more often a problem for trans women than it is for trans men, mm -hmm. because testosterone brings about so many massive changes in a body that are hard to undo. Mm -hmm. And so the arrival of testosterone for a trans man uh, changes the body very quickly. The arrival of estrogen for a trans woman who has fully developed as a male is not as much of a change. Mm -hmm. That's why you see a lot of trans women who will do facial feminization surgery before they do anything else. Mm. And so that becomes a socioeconomic issue. Yes. You know, those of us who have a lot of finances can do anything. Um, those who do not, cannot. And what we discover is those who do not pass in their new gender receive a far more difficult experience or, or, or reception from particularly in, in certain parts of the nation, particularly in the South, uh, than those who do transition. I, I, for me, I, I did not think I could transition because I thought I would not pass and I'm just not wired to be able to deal with people constantly staring or speaking mm -hmm. uh, negative words to me. And so I was shocked that at my height, I had no difficulty passing and it made my life so much easier and than if I had not passed. I, I just mm -hmm. never have any troubles so I can go anywhere. But that's the second reason we see post-transition suicidal ideation. The third is because of the internalization of transphobia. Mm -hmm. So you're a trans teenager and you live in Arkansas and your legislature passes a law that says healthcare providers in Arkansas can no longer provide hormonal treatment to trans youth. And you're one of the 200 already receiving hormonal treatment. And now your doctor says, I have to stop. You're going to have to go out of state to get that treatment. Do you think there's any chance you might internalize transphobia? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this would be exactly why trans teens are 13 times more likely to attempt suicide wow. than their peers. You know, it, it is absolutely mm. unconscionable what's taken place in Arkansas yeah. and driven primarily by the religious right. Yeah. And it just is utterly infuriating. And if, if and of fear... Course, Sorry, I was going to say, uh, okay. sorry, interrupt you. Go ahead, Paula. Sorry. Uh, well, I mean, the realization is that um, 29 states right now have over 100 similar bills pending. Wow. Wow, really? So yeah. uh, uh, all this over a bathroom. <laughs> all of this over a bathroom and over whether or not a trans child can participate in sports. In sports, yeah. Sports. That, 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 that's yeah. what, I mean, it's it's mind boggling when you think about it. I mean, it's like, how can otherwise educated people um, be but so- you know, I, th I think if you look at it from a macro view, I, I love uh, the work of um, sociobiologist uh, Edward O. Wilson on this. Mm -hmm. You know, Wilson taught at um, MIT and at Harvard and won a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. And he identified uh, that of the nine eusocial species is what he calls them. Mm -hmm. uh, the nine species that have both a selfish gene, as Dawkins would call it, and a tribal gene, that most of those species, eight of those species, have evolved in a way you would expect. An enemy right. comes into the camp, the tribe unites, defeats the enemy, life goes on. Mm -hmm. The ninth eusocial species, which is us, he says, unfortunately, has evolved to believe an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive. Mm. And where no natural enemy exists, you we create one. one. And he says, if we don't get a hold of that, we lose that species and quite possibly the planet. And so the reality is that's what evangelicalism has been doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And since they lost on the issue of marriage equality, now their enemy of choice 
is a population that absolutely has no power to do anything to stand up against them and is in fact only 0.58% of the population, right. but we have become their enemy of choice. So they've yeah. created an enemy that does not exist. Right. This is what we tend to do as a species. Mm. And I think Wilson is right. If we don't get a hold of that, we lose the species, we lose the planet. Right. And it's worse now than it's ever been really the polarization and the, and the sort of uh, indemnification of like people were making people enemies. It is far worse. It's one of the main reasons I wrote this book. And it's one of the reasons that I continue to speak when it's safe to do so yeah. in conservative environments, because I think the only way we change the, that is through narrative. Right. You know, we're a story-based species. We don't we don't sleep without dreaming and we don't dream in mathematical equations. We dream in stories. Right. And I believe if we can get on each other's front porch and tell yes. and listen to our stories, that's when we truly hear one Amen. another. Yeah. You know, I was involved in a, a, a thing last Friday with 50 trans people and 50 showrunners or writers in Hollywood. And they were asking all of us, you know, what do we need to do when it comes to the trans population? And the main thing I said was, just cast us as normal humans. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. Make the fact that we're transgender <laughs> yeah. incidental. Right. Yeah, not a well, that, big that's stretch, the reality right? of yeah. me speaking all over the yeah. world on issues of gender equity. Uh, it is, in fact, my experience as a trans person that gives me my unique perspective. But I'm not talking about trans rights in those conversations. I'm mm -hmm. talking about, about gender, gender equity. Yeah. And it just makes it so much easier for those people uh, often who are finding their first introduction to a transgender person to have it happen when that's not the subject at hand. Yeah, that's actually quite, yeah, that's that's profound when you think about it, because that's where we need to be. Um, you did, as you say, this book has, you know, it, it may have had a seed around gender, but it became a memoir. Um, and you write quite honestly. And I, I, I mean, I, I must say, um, my heart was rent uh, reading. Uh, there were tears, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's powerful the way you share about your and uh, your own experience, the vulnerability that you take on. And I can't, as you say, I can't imagine what that's like to, to read that out loud for, for the book. Um, you speak about your wife, Kathy, and your children being a support to you, but it wasn't without pain. And it wasn't without grief. And it wasn't without isolation. Um, reading about your experience, uh, as I said, really moved me. I know you told Kathy early in your marriage about being transgender, but your children, when you decided to transition, um, can you share a little bit about your family and the experience of coming out to them and how that's been f f for you? And I know you can't speak for them necessarily, but, but for all of you in a sense of how you've come through it. We chose to tell the children once I knew there was a high likelihood I was going to transition. I still wasn't sure. Mm. We had not told them because I was fully intending to live my life without transitioning. Mm -hmm. And once I began to realize that might not be possible, that's when we knew it was time to tell them. Mm -hmm. And I exploded the family narrative. There was absolutely not an ounce of me that appeared to be anything other than the alpha male I was in fact. And I loved being a father. And Jonathan and I had a wonderful relationship. And he was the first to take his leave. He really pretty much disappeared for about a year and a half. And he's written about it eloquently in his book, She's My Dad. And I wrote responses to five of those chapters. And frequently when he's doing interviews, people give him a hard time because he was pretty tough on me. <laughs> and when I read the manuscript, I thought, he's not being tough. It's, it's just, this is the reality. And it's one of the very few books written by the family member of a transgender person. And I'm so glad that it is in fact, very honest because mm -hmm. it was difficult and raw. The girl's response was initially a response of support. They wanted to make sure I was all right. But I think a lot of that is just, the difference in how we raise boys and girls. Mm. Uh, we raise boys to believe that they have the right to make whatever decision they want to make. And girls are taught to defer mm. from the time mm. it's almost as yep. a birthright that they're taught to yeah. defer. So, yeah. well, I can't think about my feelings. I got to think about my dad's feelings instead. So the girls didn't take their leave until, um, well, for Jaina, it was about three years uh, after I transitioned. For JL, it was about another year after that. Jonathan and I were talking a couple of weeks ago when I was in New York. And I said, you know, I thought it was gonna be about five years initially before we could find a new normal. I realize now it's gonna be 10. 
and that some things are not ever going to be okay. Mm. And, um, you know, I lost um, my relationship with my son, uh, the mm -hmm. father-son relationship. It's just not ever going to be the same. Mm. And I feel like the relationship with the girls is pretty close to what it was before. And I know Jaina agrees. JL hasn't talked about it recently. But for Jonathan and for Kathy, there's a fundamental shift that will never ever change. I mean, it ended our marriage. Mm -hmm. Kathy and I both knew we had the, like the world's greatest marriage therapist. He was unbelievable. Mike Solomon was his name, perfect mm -hmm. name for a marriage therapist. Mm -hmm. And we happened to be his last clients on his last day when he retired. Wow. And we're both therapists. Wow. So mm -hmm. I just asked him, I said, Mike, how many couples are willing to work this hard? And he said, 1%, didn't hesitate. Wow. I said, how many couples get this far? And again, he said, 1%, didn't mm -hmm. hesitate. And then he said, which is what makes this so tragic because you're a lesbian and Kathy's not. And I think that was the moment in which we realized, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. she's got to be true to herself as much as I have to be true to myself. Right. And so yeah. we're still close. We're still in business together, but you know, we ended our marriage. And so I, I've noticed reading the book uh, this week that it's the sections about Kathy and Jonathan where I, I cry so hard, I just have to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, one part of the book, you talk about the pain you've experienced that's been delivered by organized religion. And you, you ask the question, you know, how did something that's designed to soothe the soul of humankind turn into something designed to comfort the few at the expense of the many? How could evangelical Christianity move so far away from the teachings of Jesus? Um, if, if you're up to it and you can, would you mind reading a bit of this section about leaving conservative religion? And, and then maybe we could talk about that on the other side. Well, sure. I mean, it's what I'd love to do right now is just read my book aloud some more <laughs> after doing it. These <laughs> bastard well, Canadians, know. the bastard Canadians made me read my book some more after I've been reading you know, it all day. <laughs> and I've been told all these years that you're so nice. We're not. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's all fake. It just, fake news. Fake, fake news. It, yeah. It is. <laughs> sure. I'd be happy to do that. Thanks. This is from late in the book. I believe it's uh, probably either chapter uh, 18 or 19. It takes a brave heart to leave the cocoon of conservative religion. Long, cold nights are spent in the desert while the lights of home beckon. You cannot go back. If you do return and walk through the door, you realize it is no longer home, mm. no longer a place that is expecting you. It might be expecting a less mature you, but not the one that walks through the door. You know too much for it to ever be home again. You wonder if you will always be a nomad wandering the desert. You question why you left while those who slept in the bunk bed above you are still snuggled by the fire, content in the confines of their childhood home. The truth is that you could not stay. You had to leave. You found the courage to abandon the toxic narrative that was holding you back. You allowed your mind to take in new information and transform you. You found the courage to take the road less traveled by because you understood that religion has always been and always will be evolving. And there have been many who have come before who have traveled a courageous path similar to yours. What kind of a Christianity did I end up embracing? I gravitated toward a generous expression of Christianity. Instead of focusing on right beliefs, I have a faith that focuses on right practice. I understand Christianity is primarily loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self. Instead of God being an angry judge who sends people to hell, I understand God as the ultimate suffering participant, showing solidarity with us in our suffering. I embrace the God who comes to earth in the form of Jesus and says, I know life is hard, but I will walk every step of the way with you including through the valley of the shadow of death. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Well, transitioning costs 
you dearly when it came to the church, for sure. I, I'm wondering if you could share with our listeners um, a little bit about some of those successes that you that you had as a man in the church and how quickly that was all taken. Because as I understand it, most states have laws that protect transgender people from being discriminated against, but not so much for the church. That's a different, that's a different ball game. Right. As of this past year, all 50 states, you can't be fired for being transgendered, mm. but not if you work for a religious corporation. Wow. Uh, that they, is something, they huh? can, um, yeah, that's the United States. Mm. Uh, we kind of take that separation of church and state thing to, uh, well, maybe to an extreme. To an extreme. Yeah. I certainly believe yeah. that's the case. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was quite successful in the evangelical world. I was the CEO of one of the largest church planting organizations in the United States. At some point or another, I have preached in three of the 10 largest churches in the United States. At the mm -hmm. time that I transitioned, I was on the regular preaching team of two mega churches. And all of that was gone li literally overnight. Wow. I was just gone. I knew probably six to 10,000 people by name in the evangelical world. And I've heard post-transition from 60 in a nice way, mostly emails. Mm. I've talked to, I think, 18 or 19. Mm. I've seen six more than once and one more than twice. Wow. On the other hand, among my non-evangelical friends, I did not lose a single friend. Right. I did not lose a single mm. non-evangelical counseling client. Mm. I mean, you make of that what you yeah. will. You so know. you lost. So you lost clients in this too. I lost a handful of evangelical clients. Uh, at the time that I actually transitioned, I had no evangelical clients. Yeah. But uh, with your uh, therapy practice, often clients who finish therapy will come back for uh, when issues come into their lives. None of those folks from the past have come back. Mm. Wow. The it, ones I had uh, currently at the time I transitioned. Much to my surprise, I lost none of those, including the evangelical ones. You know, it's, it, I mean, again, I can't encourage people enough to read this. This, it is a memoir. It's more than a memoir, but it's a memoir because I, I think that for me, it was just shocking to realize. And what makes your story so unique for so many uh, of us who read it, I think, is just you had, you were really a big thing in, in evangelical circles. Uh, and so, you know, um, to, to have the courage uh, to be who you are and, and to know, and I, I'm sure that deep down uh, you might have hoped that it would be different, but to know that it would cost so dearly um, and to, to have the courage to do that, and um, it, it's incredible. I mean, I, I can't imagine what you were feeling as you had to tell people um, that you were transitioning. It must have been devastating. I just finished reading that chapter about exactly an hour ago. And God, it was hard. And the yeah. engineer, when I was done, just breathed a huge sigh and he said, oh my goodness, so many layers. Yeah, mm, yeah, 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 that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Now, the subtitle of your book, and as you said, you know, I mean, the, the seed of this was what you learned about power, sex, and the patriarchy after you transitioned. So we, we, we can't let you go without sort of touching on, on this as, as such a critical part of this book. Uh, life is harder for women. I mean, this is just a truth. <laughs> life is harder for women. And millions of people have heard your TED Talks. People want to hear from you and they want to hear what you have to say about gender equity. Um, you've lived as a man and as a woman and from clothing to childcare to who's noticed in the line at the grocery store to the cost of haircuts to dry cleaning to all of that sort of stuff you've written and exper you've experienced it all and written about it. Uh, but you also share, you know, sort of those deeper stories of, and, and you share a couple of examples. And I wonder if you might choose one, one from a Marriott and the other one from an airplane, which sort of will illustrate um, just how different it was for you when you entered into, for, exa for example, flying again as a woman now instead of as a man and how you were treated differently. Um, would you share one of those stories and chat a little bit sure. about the, mm -hmm. and, and just a bit about the importance of, of gender equity? Because I think uh, one of the things uh, I, I say here with three men on the screen with a woman is, you know, this is this, this is one of the big issues that we, as a church, we talk about faith in the public square. One of the issues that we, we need to continue to address, just talking to Yolanda uh, Pierce last week and Kathy Kong, both of whom talked about their experiences of being women in the church 
and what that's like. And so I, I think it's a critical issue. So I just wonder if you could share a bit about that. Sure. The very first time I ever flew as a woman, I was flying from Denver to Charlotte and I got on the plane and there was stuff in my seat. So I picked it up and put my stuff down and a guy said, that's my stuff. And I said, okay, but it's in my seat. So I'll hold it for you until you find your seat. And the guy said, lady, that is my seat. And I said, actually, it's not. It's my seat, 1D. But like I said, I'll be happy to hold it for you until you find your seat. I said, lady, I don't know what I need to tell you. That is my seat. I said, yeah, actually, it's not. It's my seat. At which point the guy behind me said, lady, would you take your effing argument someplace else so I can get in the airplane? Wow. Oh. I was utterly stunned. I had never been treated like that when I was a man. Yeah. I can tell you exactly what would have happened. Yeah. I would have said, excuse me, I believe that's my seat. And immediately the guy would have looked at his boarding pass and would have said, oh, I'm sorry. I know because it happened all the time. Mm -hmm. right. Right. So finally the flight attendant decides to do her job and takes our boarding <laughs> passes and says to the guy, sir, you're in 1C. She's in 1D. I put his stuff down in 1C. He does not say, I'm sorry. Then no. doesn't say thank you, nothing. And of course, you know who's next to me in 1F. It's Mr. Would you take your effing argument elsewhere? <laughs> oh, and so my friend Karen, who worked for America at DIA, she comes on board, gives the paperwork to the captain. I get to Charlotte. She called me and she said, Paula, what happened? And I told her and she said, oh, yeah. You yeah. welcome to the world of women. Yeah. And I and I find it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the one place for me that I can compare apples to apples mm -hmm. uh, because that is a uh, kind of a neutral experience or, or uh, a, um, situation in which um, life should be pretty much the same for a man as it is for a woman. Sure. And yet it's not, you know, I was yeah. flying from LAX to Honolulu because somebody has to, and the flight was <laughs> unbelievably bumpy. It was horrible. And the woman next to me said, this is a terrible flight. And I said, I know we're on an early generation, A321. And he actually can't get up above the weather until he burns off some fuel. She looked at me like I had 12 heads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then a male flight attendant comes by. She says to him, why is it so bumpy? And dismissively, he says, we have to wait a while before we can get up over the weather. And she said, oh, thank you. Oh, and I yeah, thought, yeah. <laughs> That's what I, said, <laughs> I just told you exactly yeah. why yeah. we have oh, to wait God. before we can get above the weather. But yeah. no, no, yeah. you don't want to hear it from me. No. Right. And yeah. that that kind of stuff. You oh, told somebody else on a on a walking trail or a running trail about uh, the planes that were flying in. Yeah, that was actually when I was in Hawaii one time. And the woman was, uh, they were there because they were doing um, touch and goes of some fighter jets and, and a plane came in and she said, oh, I think that's one of the new uh, jets from um, Hawaiian Airlines. And I said, yeah, actually, no, that's a, that's a uh, 7.5. So 757, it's either, uh, either American or United. They're the two that fly 757s into Mahui. And she said, oh, were you a flight attendant? <laughs> and I thought, oh my, that's a different oh story my, because yeah. I would have said yeah. something like that back when I was a guy yeah. And, yeah. and the person would have said, oh, you must be a pilot. Right. Um, you know, and instead mm -hmm. I'm just a little bit of a nerd who knows a little bit too much about airliners. That's, I mean, that's <laughs> the truth, right. which is yeah. not particularly gendered. That's not think. a gender issue, is it? No, no. Not a gender no. issue. I mean, you're allowed to be a nerd as a male or as a female. Yeah. Wow. Uh, our time's coming to an end, so we want to make sure you have a little bit of your voice left so you can go back in the recording studio and continue to, to do the recording. We've only scratched the, the surface oh. of the depth of this wonderful uh, work that you've put together, this memoir and more. Um, we really want to encourage our listeners to, to get a hold of it. It's coming out in June, is that right, Paula? Is June 1st. Focused? Okay. Uh, we've got a lot of TV shows, uh, the morning uh, network shows set up for the first week of June. Wow. Uh, which is fun. And I think there's going to be a feature in uh, People Magazine. Excellent. Um, the folks at Simon & Schuster have been wonderful with that stuff. Good. And you can order it now. People can go on to Amazon or to Barnes & Noble or any other um, website where they normally order books. You can even get it from Simon & Schuster. And you can order um, either the hardback or you can order the, the audio book. And actually, mm -hmm. 
in the middle of, of recording and it's like, oh, this is why people prefer audiobooks. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I'm actually, it's, it's very painful to read it but it's uh-huh. also redemptive. And, and I think it's going to be a good audio book. Right. And, and, and beyond redemptive is also a great offering, I think. And, mm-hmm. and I, I, you've convinced me now that I need to get the audio when it comes out, because I, I believe that what you're doing uh, takes an incredible, uh, and as you've talked about it here today, it takes a lot of bandwidth. I mean, it's emotionally, uh, it has to be exhausting. And mm-hmm. you are choosing to do this. And I know from, and Rob can probably share similar examples. And I know you would know too, Paula, as a pastor, that we've we've come across so many that have struggled so much uh, with uh, uh, being transgendered and, and trying to find uh, ways to deal with that and to come out and to have the courage to talk to people. This book is an incredible help uh, for those who are experiencing that. And if I can say it's an incredible help for those of us who are cisgendered folks who are trying to navigate what all of this means and to come to know more and to mm-hmm. put our ignorance aside and mm-hmm. to learn our way forward. And we need to hear, I, I agree, we're people of stories, of narratives. And your story is sacred and beautiful. And I'm thankful for you and for your offering of it. Oh, thanks. I think I also believe this book is a story about the hero's journey. And we mm-hmm. are all called onto the hero's journey, every last Mm -hmm. one of us. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this book will encourage all readers. I I think whether it has, you know, whether people have any interest in things related to being transgender or to gender equity, that, um, that you would look and see and examine your own life and think, well, where am I called? that I keep saying no and refusing that call because initially we mm. all refuse the call onto the hero's journey because it's always a call onto the road of trials that's right. and no one ever willingly goes onto the road of trials. That's right. It's not something we're going to do. That's right. And so I, I hope that it uh, accomplishes that for people that it says that, uh, yeah, it's worth it to go onto the road of trials uh, because uh, it's the only decent way to live. I say in the, in the uh, beginning of the book, the call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the mm. greater good. Right. And mm. I believe that that is true. Mm. Mm. That's very beautiful. Much, very much. Well, Paula Stone Williams is our guest today on The Vicar's Crossing. The book is called As a Woman, What I Learned About Power, Sex, and the Patriarchy After I Transitioned. Paula, thank you for your time, for your the gift that you've given us today and in this work that you've done. And God bless and we wish you all the best. Looking forward to, to seeing you on, on all the TV shows coming up when we watch it. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure being with you. Thank and you, you be so much. you be sure and let them know, like if you're on like NBC or ABC or any <laughs> of the morning shows or CNN, just let them know you were on the Vickers Crossing. And like, you know, this is, this TV <laughs> shows are trivial things. I mean, it's it, nice, but, it, do you, you understand? Know. I've been on the Vickers Crossing. <laughs> but see, but you, you guys got the social media thing down. Every time I open anything social media, it's like Vickers Crossing, Vickers Crossing, Vickers Crossing. <laughs> there we go. You, you, you guys got that down. Well, doing we're, good. we're doing our thing. And folks, I should say about going back to the book, if you go to our, we have a section of our webpage called Books, Books, Books. And if uh, we, we put a direct Direct link to every book of every author. So uh, once this is up, you'll be able to click on that and, and order right from there. So mm-hmm. bless thank you for you so doing much. this. And thank you, Paula. Thank, thank you. you Paula. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks again, Paula. That was absolutely wonderful. Incredible. And uh, looking forward oh, yeah. to that release coming up in another month. And we hope people will check out that book on our website too. And you can order it from there. Hey, thanks guys. That was great. Uh, thanks to our sponsors as always here in the Vickers Crossing to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, and to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. And I'm Rob Henderson oh, yeah. from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's in London, Ontario. Kevin George here, also in London, Ontario, at St. Aidan's Church. And my name is Ian. Thanks for listening. Gra- graduate of Und University. Yeah, <laughs> Underwear. Und, und hockey. Und, und hockey. <laughs> Guys, have a great week. We'll uh, see everybody next week. We'll have another episode up and going. And mm-hmm. until then, remember, Kevin, to always look both ways before you cross the street. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson, our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks! Thanks!